All right, hi everybody. I'm Shannon Lawless, as Culver said. Um, I'm here today to talk about navigating medical leave and disability accommodation. Um, one of my favorite parts of my job is just strategizing through situations with employers. And one of the most common employee situations that I help employers address is this issue of my employee has a medical issue. What are my obligations? There is a pretty complex web of laws that are triggered when you have an employee with a health issue. And today we're going to be focusing on four of those. So on the, the two disability discrimination laws, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is the federal law, and its Washington state counterpart, the Washington Law Against Discrimination. Now with those two, the Washington Law Against Discrimination is quite a bit broader than the federal law, and they're pretty different. So we'll be talking about some of those differences and focusing especially on the more protective Washington law. On the Family Medical Leave Act, which is the federal law and its Washington state counterpart, these laws are much more similar. In fact, our late Department of Labor and Industries has said we are going to delegate enforcement of uh, family medical leave issues to the federal government unless it's one of these very few areas where the Washington law is more protective. So in most cases, we're going to be talking about just FMLA. We're going to start by doing a basic compare and contrast. So first of all, who is covered? Um, these laws have different standards. The most protective is the Washington Law Against Discrimination, which applies to employers with eight or more employees. Who out there in the audience have eight or more employees? Most? Most? Okay. How about the ADA, which is 15 or more? And Still most of you. Okay, and then how about FMLA and Washington Family Leave, which is 50 or more employees? All right, so probably about half. If you don't have 50 um, or more employees, I give you full permission to take a nap or go get a dessert when we're talking about FMLA. Um, if you have under eight employees, though, I would say please still pay attention to the disability discrimination laws. It is really a best practice to comply with those no matter what size of employer you are, whereas there is no reason to go through the FMLA paperwork or the role if you don't meet that threshold. Eligible employees. Um, pretty simple for disability discrimination. Everyone is immediately covered by these laws. Now that may seem simple, but it feels tough in practice. I had an employer client who had hired an employee and two days into the job he had a psychotic breakdown. It was a really intense situation and I was on the phone with this employer and there is a feeling of incredulousness that this law and all of its protections about reasonable accommodation can apply to somebody that's been with you for two days. But it does apply. So. Um, remember that. With the FMLA, um, you have a little bit more protection. An employee is only covered if they meet these three criteria. They're pretty straightforward, but just to walk through them, they must have been with you for at least 12 months. Now that 12 months, it's over a seven year period. So if there was a break in service, they can still meet that 12 month threshold. Within the last 12 months, they have to have worked uh, 1,250 hours and then they must be at a location with 50 or more employees within 75 miles. Obligations. This is the 30,000 foot overview. We're going to be doing a deeper dive into both of these laws, but so you get the big picture. The disability discrimination laws primarily apply to an employee's own health. They say, one, if you have an employee with a disability, you have to provide them with a reasonable accommodation that will allow them to perform the essential functions of their job. And two, you can't take adverse action on the basis of somebody's disability. So that means firing, but also failing to promote them, um, and other less obvious forms of adverse action, like schedule changes or um, less desirable assignments. The FMLA is uh, a little bit simpler and narrower. It requires you to provide 12 weeks of unpaid job protected leave to qualifying employees or in the case of certain kinds of military caregiver leave, it's 26 weeks. Covered conditions. Um, these laws are each narrower and broader in different ways. So starting with disability discrimination, I've put a definition of disability from the Washington Law Against Discrimination up here because it is more protective than the federal law. 
As a general premise, I would say, if you think it is possibly a disability, it is a disability. This is an incredibly broad law. Um, it, it covers both emotional, uh, mental, and physical illnesses. So it covers anxiety, depression, um, conditions you can't see with your eyes. It covers actual and perceived conditions. So if you ima imagine that an employee has a disability, you still cannot discriminate against them on that basis, even though that is not a real disability. And then it doesn't matter if it's temporary or permanent or how it affects their life activities. Um, so your average broken bone, even though it may only affect the employee for a little while, is still going to count as a disability. On the FMLA family leave side, uh, it is limited to serious health conditions. In general, what that means is something requiring hospitalization, something requiring three days off of work plus a doctor's care, and then the trickier one is a health condition that requires multiple treatments and that if left untreated would be likely to result in three days off work and doctor's care. So a great example of that might be physical therapy. Um, even though physical therapy only requires a couple of hours a, a, a week, if the underlying condition could cause the employee to be off work for three days or more, then that's going to be a serious health condition. The FMLA also requires um, time off to care for certain family members, and then also some qualifying circumstances for uh, military family members, and then also birth adoption foster care. Um, one more point on the FMLA's coverage. Um, immediate family members are technically the covered members, and that's pretty straightforward, right? Spouse, parent, and child. Um, but it's not as straightforward as it seems. Be careful of what is called in loco parentis. There is a concept that if somebody has stood in the position of a parent or a child to an employee, even if they aren't biologically that person's parent or child, is that they can still be covered. Uh, a grandparent is a very common example. If a grandparent raised your employee and the employee wants to take time off to care for that aging grandparent, that could be covered. So when you're making eligibility determinations, don't assume that a family member is not covered um, just because they're not in that obvious immediate family core group. Dig deeper to the next step so you don't get caught denying leave that shouldn't be denied. All right, so going into our deep dive with FMLA. Um, first of all, when is your obligation as a covered employer triggered? Um, well, the employee doesn't need to say any magic words. They don't need to say, I want FMLA leave, or even, I you know, need medical time off. If you become aware that an employee has a life circumstance or a health condition that might be covered, you are obligated to make the initial eligibility determination and to reach out and get more information. When you are on notice that an employee um, needs the eligibility determination, you have five business days to make that determination. Um, again, eligibility are those three factors we talked about earlier. 12 months, 1,250 hours, and 50 or more employees um, within 75 miles. And once you've made the determination, you're going to provide the initial piece of paperwork, which is the written notice of eligibility, rights, and responsibilities. The government has uh, kindly drafted this for you. Um, this red text here is a link, so if you find these, um, these slides on our website, you can find that, or you can pretty easily Google it. The Department of Labor has it. If the employee is eligible, so they meet that initial, um, that initial three prongs criteria, you then have to make a determination of whether the circumstance or health condition is covered. That's more complicated. Um, for serious health conditions, you have the option to get a certification from a doctor. And although you don't have to get a certification, we really encourage employers to be consistent. In general, you want to be getting the certification because what you don't want is to be the employer who only asks for it when you think somebody's faking it or to be, which is just, it's going to look bad, or if you're inconsistently asking for that certification, it can lead to um, an accusation that you are targeting specific employees because of a protected class. So in general, you want to get that certification. And then finally, the doctor's certification 
often it doesn't match what the employee thinks or wants um, to have for their leave. So it gives you the ability to rely on the medical professional in certifying how much leave is going to be required and really defining what is the condition that the employee is taking the leave for. Generally, if employees have 15 days to return the certification, um, but if they bring it back incomplete or you can't read the doctor's handwriting, not that we ever see that, um, you have to give them a written notice of a deficiency and they get another seven days to fill it in. Once you receive the completed certification, then you have um, five business days to provide the written designation notice. And that's what's going to ultimately tell the employee, yes, this is covered, here's how long we anticipate your review is going to be. And again, there is a link in your materials. First, um, what, are, what are your requirements once the employee actually has taken leave? Um, first and simplest, maintain their health benefits. You have to do this on the same level that you were doing it before. So if the employee was contributing to premiums before, they need to keep paying in on the same level. Um, you can't ask them to be doing more, um, but you also don't have to suddenly shoulder that burden. Um, you can just let it continue on with the previous plan. Regarding PTO, um, you can, your employees can elect to use their accrued PTO um, just as they could with any other kind of leave following their company's plan. And you as an employer can also require um, employees to use PTO. So sometimes if you want to get down the liability on your books, um, you can, can require this and we recommend that you just have a consistent policy, make it available in your handbook so that employees know to expect this and they can plan for this. FMLA itself allows the leave to be unpaid. Um, now, Hannah earlier talked about how our state is doing a new um, paid sick leave law that's going to be coming to effect in January. And certainly many companies have policies where you pay um, for especially uh, maternity and paternity leave is common. So you need to be following other law and you need to be following your own company's plan, but FMLA itself does not require any kind of pay during the time off. Okay, extensions and return to work. Um, how many of you out there have experienced an FMLA leave where the employee asks to extend the leave? Pretty common, right? And, and part of that is because health is unpredictable. And uh, part of that is because having time off is great and people are smart and they really want to continue. Uh, so this comes up all the time. Um, when can you ask for a new doctor's certification? Well, the main circumstances are if there has been a change to the length of time that was originally certified or the reason it was originally certified. It's completely legitimate to go back and ask for a new certification under those circumstances. And for the same reasons that I recommended you get a doctor's certification in the first place, we recommend that you do go back and get that certification if there's been a change. Don't be um, enforcing this policy just with the employees that you expect are abusing it. It's much better to be consistent across the board so that you can explain that decision. And then finally, when the leave concludes, assuming that it concludes within the protected 12 weeks, you are required to return the employee to the same or an equivalent position. All right, intermittent FMLA, the headache of HR professionals. Um, so this is, um, the general principle is that this is FMLA leave that is taken in very short increments. Just how short? Well, the longest is an hour. And if you allow your PTO to be taken in shorter increments than an hour, you need to also allow FMLA to be tracked in those shorter increments. So 15-minute PTO increments, 15-minute FMLA increments. Um, also, how, how many hours do they get if only it were calculated on just a 40-hour work week? Um, it's not. If your employee works an average um, work week that is longer than 40 hours, you need to use that average work week to calculate how many hours of um, intermittent FMLA they're going to get. Um, and so, you know, make sure that you're doing that calculation right and not assuming a 40-hour work week. It is required that intermittent FMLA leave be offered when it is medically necessary, and there are you know, many doctors out there that will certify this. Um, but there is some good news for employers. If the leave is foreseeable, the employee must schedule the leave to limit disruption to your business. 
So it comes up a lot, you know, physical therapy is another great example. If the employee has some control over scheduling those appointments, you can work with your employee and they have to sit down with you and say, okay, you know, try not to take it on Friday if that's our busy day, or try to schedule your appointment in the morning or the afternoon. Ultimately, the medical necessity is going to trump um, your, your business concerns, but at least they have to engage in that process and make a reasonable effort. All right, moving on to the disability discrimination laws. I didn't see anybody leave to get a dessert, but now you all have to pay attention. Um, so the, the first point on this slide is to engage in the interactive process. So again, getting back to that basic obligation, if you become aware that an employee has a medical need that is affecting their work performance or that may affect their work performance in the future, Regardless of whether they use any magic words, ADA or accommodation, you as an employer have an obligation to engage in this interactive process. Now, I could talk about the interactive process for an hour, I won't, uh, but to give a very big picture recap, this is the informal process of communication between an employer and employee that identifies the scope of how the disability is affecting their work and identifies potential solutions to that. It can be in meetings, it can be in emails, it can be in telephone calls, often it's in all three. And for us as employers, the most important thing is to document all of those interactions. A log is a great way to do it if you're using a mix of all three, but every communication to the empl uh, employee about uh, accommodations should be put in their personnel file so that you can clearly document that you have made every reasonable effort to identify all of the accommodations that may be available. Now, a particular note to our presentation today is the leave of absence. A leave of absence may be a reasonable accommodation. And unfortunately, unlike FMLA, which has a clear bright line at 12 weeks, there is no such bright line in disability discrimination law. Um, employers always want to know how long do I have to let an employee be on a leave of absence be before it becomes unreasonable. Um, looking at the cases in general, over six months is going to be unreasonable. Um, I still wouldn't draw a bright line there. You always have to do a fact specific analysis. But certainly, um, in many cases, it has been held that longer than 12 week weeks is reasonable. And what that means is that when somebody's FMLA leave expires, that is not a license to get rid of that employee. If they're not back at work, it still may be a reasonable accommodation to give them additional time off to complete um, the healing process and come back to work. The good news is that no employer is required to give indefinite leave. Um, here's again where getting a doctor's input can be really important. Um, if a doctor gives a range, it would be reasonable, say, to accommodate a six to eight week leave of absence in some circumstances. But if the doctor can give no time when that employee is ever going to be able to get back to work, you don't have to accommodate that. Um, the other good news for employers here is that you get to choose. So if there are multiple accommodations that would work for an employee, um, the employer gets the right to pick which one. Often that means that you can pick a less expensive one first. And in the cases of a leave of absence, it may mean requiring somebody to be at work when you want them to be there and being productive. So if the choice is between a standing desk and four weeks off of work to heal, you could say, I'm giving you the standing desk and I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> All right, pregnancy. Um, I specifically wanted to talk about pregnancy because this is a trap and I think that it's not commonly known, we deviate pretty substantially from federal law here in Washington, and so be careful of this one. Um, the Washington Law Against Discrimination, as implemented by the Washington Human Rights Commission, gives a pregnancy disability leave period that is generally six to eight weeks long. Could be more or less, but for most normal births, it's six to eight weeks. That is associated with the time recovering from childbirth. That time runs concurrently with your federal FMLA leave, but consecutively with your Washington family leave, which means that when you have recovered from childbirth, um, arguably, after six to eight weeks, um, then your 12 weeks of bonding time starts under, um, under state law, 
which leads to 18 to 20 protected weeks for pregnant employees in Washington State. So don't get tripped up on the 12-week standard that we're so used to. It's more in Washington for pregnant employees. And here we are specifically talking about women who have given birth as opposed to um, the 12 weeks of protected leave for everybody um, because of that disability component. Discharging employees with health issues. Um, this is an area in which you should use extreme caution. Um, it's a dangerous proposition to terminate somebody's employment because of a health issue, but it happens. Sometimes people have um, medical issues and they can't come back to work, and it's a tough situation for the employer and the employee. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is give you some basic criteria that have to be met before you can even consider making this decision, but again, it's not one to make lightly. So first of all, make sure that all the FMLA and Washington Family Leave Act is, leave is exhausted. Um, second, the employee cannot be able to perform the essential functions of the job. Now that's often obvious if they're on leave and they can't work at all, right? They can't do their essential job functions. But you need to really walk through that analysis. Take a look at their job description, what does it require, and talk with them if there are any way they could do these essential job functions. Because if so, you're having an accommodation conversation, not a termination one. So that really flows into this next bullet point. You need to have explored all alternative accommodations through the interactive process Leave no email or question from the employee unanswered. Um, you want to make sure that you have fully explored every possible option. And finally, when you do, um, make, do the discharge, you are required under Washington law to take affirmative steps to help the employee look for other vacant positions. Um, and those steps should be taken, including after the discharge, and to assist in reapplying if requested. Um, that is a, a pretty heavy burden and frankly not one that most employers are thrilled about taking, but it's very important that you can show and document that you've looked within your company to see are there other positions that would meet that employee's restrictions and have you talked about those positions with the employee and let them know that if they want to apply for a job, you're going to be there to help them do it. All right, so in conclusion, I've prepared all of these great hypothetical examples that I definitely don't have time to talk about today. Um, so find me a cocktail hour and we can either talk about something totally unrelated or I'll give you my great hypothetical about Sam in the Walla Walla office. Um, the one thought that I do want to make sure to leave you all with is this, which is remember compassion. We've given you a lot of boxes to check legally when an employee comes to you with a medical issue. Um, but remember the human side of this first. It is often in the most difficult of circumstances that an employee with a medical issue is approaching their employer to talk about um, these things. Take the time to listen, put down your notes, just hear what they're going through, look them in the eye, express from a human point of view that you care about what they're experiencing, and then talk to them about their leave and their legal rights and how it's going to work with their job. Um, not only is that the right human thing to do, but I would say that it's one of your best legal protections because an employee that feels that their company cares about them and that the people they work with care about them is much less likely to become a plaintiff.